Karl Marx said that philosophers have explained the world. It is our job to change it. I say Chesterton has explained what's wrong with the world. It is our job to restore it. Um, a specter is haunting the powerful and the corrupt, and that is the specter of the independent, free, renegade video journalist. <laughs> and that journalist seeks to correct the wrongs in the society we live in. There is a lot wrong with the society we live in. Um, Chesterton says, quote, the position we have now reached is this. Starting from the state, we try to remedy the failures of all the families, all the nurseries, all the schools, all the workshops, all the secondary institutions that once had some authority of their own. Everything is ultimately brought into the courts. It seems like the world has become one giant divorce court. And as Dale has said in his book, schools have become surrogate parents. Regulation has replaced conscience. If you look at Washington, D.C., the people in Congress don't solve the great problems of the society. They pick winners and losers, and they bail out the losers. Um, um, there is an unholy alliance between uh, what Chesterton was talking about just before, big business and big government in this country, and people don't see it. Um, how did I get started doing what I do? It all starts with what else? Lucky Charms breakfast cereal. <laughs> I hope everyone's familiar with Lucky Charms. <laughs> now, I am Irish. My last name is O'Keefe. I am six foot two inches tall. I have blonde hair. My great, 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 I lost count, but one of my grandparents died in the Irish potato famine. Lucky Charms has a picture of a leprechaun on the front cover. And he's little short. He's got green hat and orange hair. I think that's racist. <laughs> We're not lucky. <laughs> So could I, could I, by making a reasonable, rational argument, walk into my college dining hall with a box of Lucky Charms on St. Patrick's Day, 2005, and make the argument that Lucky Charms breakfast cereal is racist, and could I get it removed from Rutgers Dining Hall? Well, that's the first video I did, and I got Lucky Charms removed. <laughs> And I said, you know, I'm not lucky, and this is racist, and it, you know, teeth, teeth rotting marshmallows, and the importance of the clover, and the Catholic Church, and so forth. And the bureaucrat marked everything down and said, uh huh, uh huh, you know, diversity, and we got it banned, and I got it banned on, a, on another campus as well. <laughs> and the guy, and the guy in Texas said, well, yeah, you know, Taco Bell. I said, yes, Taco Bell. That's racist too, the Chihuahua. <laughs> When I visit these government bureaus in my investigative videos, I find that nothing shocks people anymore. Nothing shocks a bureaucrat. They have, there's a sense of soullessness to the way that people conduct their affairs. I mean, in one other video, I got married. I, no, I am, I am heterosexual. I got married to a, a, a male friend of mine. I, I got a marriage license. I said that I wanted to get married and I want to get divorced in a week. I just want the benefits. And they married me. Um, they, did, I, they didn't blink an eye. In another video, I called the Department of Labor. I said I was an illegal British immigrant, used in British accent, and said that I had lost my sombrero. I want another sombrero. Would the Department of Labor help me? Yeah, they referred me to the appropriate hotline to get a sombrero. And of course, darkly and hauntingly, I called Planned Parenthood, the abortion provider, and said that, in, of course, I don't have a drop of racism in my heart. I, I work with a lot of black friends and Hispanic friends in my investigative videos, but I said on tape, um, I want to donate money to Planned Parenthood on the grounds that there are too many black children in the world and I want to get rid of them. And Planned Parenthood responded, that's exciting, that's understandable, I want to make sure I don't leave anything out. So that actually got some people suspended. And that's when I started to realize that the way to reveal the truth is not to just talk about truth, not to just you know, uh, bring out the truth. It's to bring out the ridiculousness and the absurdity of your opposition. Um, as I said, the bureaucrats weren't shocked in any of the situations I talk about. They're never shocked. They don't care. Uh, it's almost absurd to suggest they should care. 
I often, if you look at the YouTube comments, so what? What are you, what are you proving? Um, and that's how a lot of people react out there. It's almost absurd to suggest anyone should look beyond the letter of the law to solve their problems. It's almost absurd to suggest virtue. Um, so what's the solution to this atmosphere of moral mediocrity, uh, which paralyzes man's noble impulses, uh, which makes them depend strictly upon what is legal? Ask young people today what they're going to do to change the world, and they always answer, I'm going to law school. <laughs> I went to law school for a year, I couldn't take it. Um, it is not the law that changes the world, it is, I think, journalism. It's a great scoop, a hidden camera, a sensational video, someone caught on tape saying something true, something they don't tell you when they're at a podium. Um, lawyers and legislators did not defund ACORN. A video camera and a bunch of hookers did that. Look at what Chesterton did with his own life. He was a journalist, and journalism can do a lot of great things for this world. It is not just that journalism seeks to expose government, corporations, and social services, institutions, unethical behavior. Journalism is itself a service that gives us the truth and thus frees us. There is no power as great as the press, but not just any press, something called a free press. I believe Chesterton took over a paper called The New Witness from Hilaire Belloc for the purposes of providing something that is uniquely free, provides truth. And Belloc referred to this as uh, the mainstream media, what we call today the mainstream media, as the official press. Many of us refer to it as uh, the mainstream media. And this press is not about truth, it's about the suppression of truth, the propagation of falsehood, and the boycott of inconvenient doctrine. The current press is not free. As Belloc has said, it is a system that favors the status quo and professional politicians. They both feed off one another. They both elevate one another, put each other in the spotlight to keep themselves in business. Knowledge is a monopoly. Information comes to the public in thin and selected streams. The media truly does favor the regime and protects it at all costs, and devotes all their resources to investigating not government, but other investigative journalists like me. Just if you don't believe me, look at the scandals over the last decade. I'll name a couple. Look at the Lewinsky scandal in the 1990s. Regardless of what you think about Bill Clinton, that was a huge, that was a huge news event. Monica Lewinsky. Uh, cheating in the Oval Office. Who broke that scandal? Was it the Washington Press Corps? Or was it a young journalist named Matt Drudge of the Drudge Report? In his Hollywood Los Angeles apartment, broke a story that eventually impeached the President of the United States. What does that say about the Washington Press Corps? <laughs> when a man 3,000 miles away or whatever it is, <laughs> breaks a story on the internet. Um, and what does it say about the Washington Press Corps when a 20-year-old girl named Hannah Giles spends her own money flying across the country with me to investigate an organization with direct ties to the President of the United States, spends her own money to fly across the country posing as a hooker. She's a Christian, she's a, she's a daughter of a minister. To do that, what does it say about the press? And the media initially ignored the ACORN story until Congress and Senate voted to defund it uh, based on what this young woman found with her own money. Uh, soon thereafter, the government accountability team at the Washington Post spent more time investigating me and where I get my money from than the organization with ties to the president. What does it say when a newspaper like the New York Times sends a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter down to Louisiana to, invest to interview everyone that lived next door to me while I was conducting my investigation of Senator Landrieu? What does it say when that newspaper didn't even ask Senator Landrieu what was going on in her office that day? Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar with Senator Landrieu, I was arrested for doing an investigation in Louisiana. Uh, I was given a misdemeanor for walking, a false pretense, walking onto federal government property, posing as something I am not. And I suppose if you walked onto federal property as Santa Claus, that would be a crime. Maybe Barney the Dinosaur, that would be a crime. <laughs> I, I posed as a telephone repairman. Uh, the government later destroyed my tape, so no context could be given. And there was a campaign in the media to label me a wiretapper, um, which was completely untrue. I was just trying to strike up a conversation and get some honest truth. But if you are part of the free press and actually expose a political scandal, you will suffer for it in this country. It, it is intolerable uh, to those in the media that, that young people, independent people who have access to YouTube could possibly have all that power. They're just, we're just obscure no, nobodies. Yet we can actually influence Congress 
And another anecdote is Mother Jones Magazine, another uh, so-called uh, you know, fearless journalism magazine that really was supposed to be about taking on power structures, and I'm all for that. I do that myself. After Landrieu, we had reason to believe that they were conspiring with the US government to leak my personal emails. Imagine that. A, a newspaper dedicated and founded on the principle of challenging government is cooperating with government to take on a young investigative journalist. That's how far we've come in this country. And you may even be subject to the risk of ruin and loss of liberty. As Chesterton points out, there's two forms of this, slander and silence. It is the greatest censorship to silence someone, but you silence them by, by ignoring them. And if that doesn't work, they'll call you a criminal. And if that doesn't work, they'll call you a racist. They'd call me a radical, but I refer to myself as a radical, so they don't get away with that. So they call me a conservative. Um, they'll call me an activist, but Chesterton has called a journalist. He's actually an activist at heart. He was an activist. At heart, every good journalist is an activist. Every good human being is an activist. Some may say that nuns and monks aren't activists. In fact, they're the greatest activists. <laughs> they spend their entire days being activists for our benefit. There's activism through mind, body, and heart, and prayer is, in fact, the greatest activism. But then they'll challenge your identity as a journalist. And you know what? I don't really care what they label me. Uh, I don't really like the label journalist anyway, because unlike journalists, people on my team actually do investigative reporting. <laughs> if your videos are in context, it doesn't matter. They'll use hyperbolic accusations. You heavily edit your videos. But everyone heavily edits everything. The speech is heavily edited. The articles are heavily edited. The New York Times heavily edits. In one case, I had, a, I had a reporter call up a friend of mine, spent an hour on the phone, he took one word, whoa, and put it in the article. Asked about James O'Keefe, Greg Walker said, whoa. So, <laughs> when reporters start posting unedited transcripts of conversations with their subjects, then we'll be on heavy playing field. But until then, I will post unedited videos of everything I do, along with my packages, because that's what journalism is. They'll go, they'll do anything. They'll call your undercover tactics immoral, falling outside the journalism Bible, the code of ethics. What is this journalism code of ethics? Who wrote this journalism? The Columbia Journalism Review? I've heard some of those people speak. They're kind of crazy. And what, and what is journalism? Is journalism asking questions at press conferences and getting official responses? Is that journalism? To expect someone to be honest with you when you put a microphone in their face in front of a million people, that's not journalism, that's stenography. <laughs> if I had walked into Acorn, addressed like this, and said, hi, my name is James O'Keefe, I'm doing a story on corruption, would you start brothels with underage prostitutes? I, would have, I don't know what would have happened. If I walked into Senator Landry's office, identified myself as a reporter, and said, now, did you shut your phones down so that your constituents couldn't reach you? I don't think they would probably have been honest with me. So what I do is I go behind closed doors, posing as telephone people and pimps and prostitutes and racists and all these nefarious characters in order to expose the humanity of public officials. How extreme can I go before they submit that they have a soul? You know what, dude? Lucky, this is ridiculous. Lucky Charms, racist, what, what, I mean, but no one ever does that. I can't get to the point where they finally admit to me that, that I've gone too far. <laughs> and, 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 and then they say that this is immoral. How is this immoral? Uh, Belloc has said that salary, you know, shouldn't salaried public servants be perpetually watched and kept under control, be suspicious? I think this is the... The, the, the nadir of morality. I think this is the most moral thing you could possibly do. There's a movie with Al Pacino called The Insider where he says to CBS News executives, we won't air the show because our subject is telling the truth. And the more truth he tells, the worse it gets. The people in corporate media play this game with those in power. They will never quote soberly and simply describe a professional politician like he really is. We might actually see these politicians as they are. Well, they won't do that. They don't want to report what happens behind closed doors. They want to continue the illusion that these people are kings and queens, that they're special, that they're magical. You get to thrill up your leg when you listen to them. <laughs> <laughs> the 
few owners of the press will turn off the limelight and make a brief, accurate statement about the mediocrities of those in power, whether it's to protect their sources or to get future access or to keep on with the trade or to get helicopter rides with the vice president. I don't know what it is. Now, Dale has pointed out that the, this official media is vulgar and silly, and that the reason it's vulgar and silly is because the millionaires who own the mainstream media are vulgar and silly. I agree. Vanity Fair, NBC, I don't care who you are. These are not newsmen. They're a perverted form of businessmen. And I'm a capitalist, uh, but capitalism has its faults. As Bilak has said, capitalism cannot write. Capitalism cannot pray, marry, or make a joke. Um, and Belloc says, quote, half tragic and half comic, the economic difficulty of the free journalist, the difficulty of obtaining information, the difficulty of distributing it. Chesterton says, nothing, as a matter of fact, goes every night through more agonies of adventure, more hairbreadth escapes, desperate expedients, crucial counsels, random compromises, barely averted disasters. And that's just writing an article. <laughs> Imagine going undercover in a government office in Oregon. But the truth will prevail, and that may come as a surprise to you given all the handicaps. How is that possible? Because the truth has a power unto its own. The truth confirms itself. Belloc wrote, and I want you to listen to this because this was written, I don't know, a hundred years ago or something, but it's so similar to today. Half a million people read of a professional politician that his oratory has an electric effect, or that he is full of magnetism. He can sway an audience to tears or laughter, but the truth about him is that he's dull. And he flogs up these stale phrases, phrases like, who's ass to kick? Um, <laughs> oh, as a reference to the oil spill. The, po the point is people hear the politician speak, they receive primary and true impression about him, and they're likely to pay attention to that independent who corroborates their impression. They're not gonna listen to the mainstream press who has some fantasy impression. And the ordinary man is not interested in the stenography. And we are constantly, by the way, a target of lawyers and of the legal profession and of the prosecutors and everyone who is in conspiracy with one another to stop the truth. Recently, a citizen in this state of Maryland was yielding a camera at a traffic stop and filmed an officer uh, who took out his gun when he was on his motorcycle and some officer misconduct and now this young man, simply for taping the officer misconduct, faces 16 years in prison for filming the officer at a public traffic stop because of some law that says that you can't film people without their permission. It was written 70 years ago before the camera was invented. <laughs> and it's so ridiculous, but people say it's, law, it's the law. But Belloc says that if you look at history and all the great reforms that have started, not through a widespread control acting downwards, but through spontaneous energy, local and intensive, acting upwards. We must expose the mainstream media like we expose fraud, corruption, waste, abuse, and the politicians themselves. We can do this because the mainstream media and the official press is vulnerable, like all things built on lies are vulnerable. And we must use creative and courageous means to tackle the media and the lawyers. And we must tackle them all at once. And that, to respond to George Stephanopoulos' question to me, is what we mean when we say we want to create chaos for glory. We face a lot of severe handicaps. I've gotten sued many times. I've been imprisoned falsely. I've had newspapers run front page stories with my mugshot on them when they've ignored the, the stories I'm famous for. How ironic is that? And conspicuously absent from any of these lawsuits is the veracity of the tapes themselves. No one has doubted the employees have said what they've said. Um, we don't have a lot of money. In fact, I'm, we're personally, financially, not doing very well. But most of these investigations aren't very expensive. In fact, the best ones are most times free. How weird is that? Um, lawyers have tried to stop the creative process, but it is our creative process that allows us to remain unstoppable. And I think the truth will prevail despite these financial handicaps and legal handicaps. And I make an analogy between something that you might not think there'd be an analogy to be made. But our journalism endeavor sort of relates to Chesterton's analysis of St. Francis and his book. St. Francis was penniless, parentless. He had a problem of a ruined and neglected church, which has been the standing point of St. Francis' crime and punishment. And it dawned on St. Francis that one of the great paradoxes, which is also one of the great platitudes, 
And I think this paradox applies to the paragon of investigative journalism. And that paradox was the way to build a church is not to become involved in the law, become a lawyer, or deal with bargaining in the community or trying to get access or trying to get approval. The way to build a church is not necessarily to pay for it, not with other people's money, and certainly not with your own money. The way to build a church is to build it. So St. Francis went about collecting stones. He became a new sort of beggar, one that not asks for money, but instead asks for stones to build a church. He worked with his own hands, rebuilding his church without money from anyone, and presumably without knowledge of building anything. And along the way, he learned lessons. He got his hands dirty. He was probably very cold because he didn't have any clothes, but he had a church, and he transcended all the crap with the law, with the money, and with dealing with community permits and so forth. Nowadays, if you have an internet connection, a video camera, and a little bit of courage, you are more powerful than the New York Times. And if you have the right story, well, you might embarrass the New York Times, as we did with Acorn. And if you need a ride to get from place to place, place maybe you can borrow your friend's car. I borrowed my sister's car to film the Acorn videos because I did not own a car. I slept on couches. Or sometimes you sleep on boats or you sleep on beaches in Oregon. You'd be surprised the places you sleep when you're undercover. And if you're on probation, which I was on, and you aren't allowed to leave your state of New Jersey, you can always get a job at the local Census Bureau. <laughs> and you don't have to lie about who you are. Um, and in the worst possible situation, when you're broke and in debt, having been sued into oblivion, you can be out on the street, unwashed, begging for a ride to the nearest government bureau, exchanging your driver's license at a local pawn shop for a video camera. We will not be stopped. Nothing can stop us. I don't care what it is. I will have to beg for stones if I have to. I will not going to stop doing what I do. I don't care how many times they sue me or imprison me. I'm not going to stop seeking the truth. And what are we all waiting for? What stops Christians from taking action? Why do I hear so many excuses from people on why they won't fight the good fight? There is great joy in fighting. It means good is being defended and bad is being attacked. People always look for the finer points of morality to evade action. You may think community organizer Saul Linsky has nothing to do with Chesterton. Well, you're right. <laughs> but, well, Alinsky made the argument, and I, and I actually encourage you, if you could, to read his book, because it's fascinating. He, Alinsky made the argument, there are two examples of people who evade action. First, there is the priest who wants to be a bishop and bootlegs and politics his way up, justifying it with the rationale, after I get to be a bishop, I'll use my office for Christian reformation. Or the businessman who reasons, first I'll make a million dollars, and then I'll go for the real things in life. I cannot tell you how many times I've been around the country meeting people with this attitude. Well, once I become a millionaire, then I'll finally be able to get my hands dirty and change the world. But as Chesterton points out, it is the millionaires who are vulgar and silly. It, they're the ones who own the mainstream media. Alinsky says the same thing. One changes in many ways on the road to, to being bishop or the first million. The millionaire says, well, you know, or the bishop says, I'll wait until I'm cardinal and then I can be more effective or I can do more after I get my second million dollars, and so forth. So take a look at what's at Saint, uh, take a look at St. Francis the way Chesterton did. If you want to build the church, you must build it. If you want to investigate government or find the truth, you must start investigating and finding truth. And if you want to be a journalist, you must continue, you might have to be free and poor. You must continue to have courage and creativity. Power comes, I think, in two forms, people and money. We don't have money, we have people. And we don't have a lot of people, but we have certain people who are very courageous and very creative. And of course, the most important thing, and finally, you know, the most simplest thing is that the, the, the media is just, the mainstream media is just boring. You know, these vulgar and, and silly is just boring. So of course, you have to create interesting content. And so thank you very much for uh,